uh, put a poster out, and I wait uh, 300 days, uh, and we file a patent application. That's okay in the U.S. because we have this one-year grace period. Uh, it's not okay uh, most other places. So in Europe, for example, you'll have uh, hurt your opportunity to get patent protection in Europe. And like I said, many companies are going to be very interested in having protection outside the U.S. So while this grace period is a nice thing, um, it's not great in, from the standpoint of it's not helpful outside the U.S. So again, you know, be careful what you're doing. Make sure you get your, your patenting in order before uh, you start doing any of these other activities. Otherwise, your patenting is not going to be very impressive. And people doing diligence are going to find out. And at the very least, the value of what you have to um, offer people is going to diminish. The one-year group period, does that apply to the right now? Good question. OK. Um, the way it works is if you file your, you know, usually here's a strategy. I'll answer your, your question by sort of a general strategy we use. So if, if you come and say, OK, uh, Scott, I've got this paper. It's coming out tomorrow. It's going to go online tomorrow. Pub when I say published, by the way, that could be online, too, in my world. Um, paper's coming out tomorrow. Uh, we got to do something. So Scott says, OK, hope he calls me, and asks me to uh, file a provisional patent application on that. OK, so that gets us a date of uh, June 15th, June 14th. We did it today. Uh, 2011. So, and their paper comes out on, on June 15th. Okay, so um, not a perfect situation for reasons I won't get into, but it's it's better than if we've not filed anything. So, at least on, um, you know, basically from that point on, we've we've protected ourselves for um, to a degree for uh, U.S. filing or foreign filing. Filing outside the United States, so it, the provisional does that. That's why I say getting the, the, the filing date is very important, uh, and that's a key aspect of a provisional. So, so better you do what we talked about than you, you say, ah, it's, I didn't give Scott enough time. We can't do anything. Better to see what we can do. You really don't want to cover anything before you do That would be my advice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you, the trouble is once the you know once you let the, the cow out of the barn, whatever, you can't put it back, and um, it, it, I, I will tell you, especially in, in I work for a number of, of universities. I'll tell you, more times than not, people you know that are doing diligence will come and say, "Well, look, this paper came up, uh, this abstract. I found these things." And um, for a variety of reasons, aside from starting a company, this is a big problem to be surprised by that. It's better we know about it, and better better yet that we dealt with it before. It, uh, came out so very um, you know I don't want to get in the way of academic freedom or anything else I, you know that's that's all your your choices but at the end of the day that's just understand the consequence of, of having something come out without having a patent application in place yeah uh, that uh, kind of relates to something that probably a lot of us are involved with as professors if you're putting a paper out then quite likely it's on something that you've been talking about in class does that complicate the issue? I guess um, I, well, I uh, one of the issues, it could, it could. I mean, I, I have some view that, you know, the, I haven't really encountered that much. I mean, one argument would be that it's not really a, a disclosure because it's not really going to the public. But on the other hand, you don't have a confidential relationship with your students. So. Yeah, your student videotapes it uh, on his uh, <laughs> or whatever, right. post it on YouTube right. that, that afternoon. Yep. That afternoon. The day before your paper comes no, out. That's right. So I mean, I think you know, I think mo <laughs> most contexts, as I understand it, uh, in a regular class, people aren't talking about their their basic research to a level that. Oh, uh, yeah. I. Uh, you know better than me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd say that's kind of the realm for us. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, you agree? Yeah. You're. In fact, a lot of times you're trying out your ideas on your students. As a, I mean, students are a great way to poke holes in your ideas or yeah. to show weak, uh, weak points. Not to distract you. No, well, the phone is <laughs> not like <laughs> Make it go away. <laughs> Gee, when I'm a, when I'm a professor not or a you. teacher, my students are doing that. Now I'm a student and yeah. my professor. Right. <laughs> what did I do? I meant to shut it off. <laughs> well, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, Generally speak, I mean, the issue is what you say is really, you know, you know, if you if you talk in generalities, 
then you're, you know, it, may, it may be a disclosure, but it may not be a disclosure of what we actually are protecting. It just all kind of depends on the details. But, you know, and I haven't really, I have to tell you, in general, most people are more exercised about posters, abstracts, because that's generally the way research results are, are, are disclosed. But I can't disagree that it's, it's a potential issue if you're out there giving that much information to students. So what we're paid for. I know. Well, yeah. Well, that's the, that's the challenge of, of, of patenting um, in an academic environment. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's just consequences to what, you know, like I said, I'm not going to stand in the way of academic, you know, what you, your job is. Generally, we like, I think we like to work within uh, what you have to do to try to be helpful as opposed to, you know, get in the way of it. Well, there's a natural tension, and there has been for some time, between intellectual freedom and intellectual property. Well, one of the things that the uh, U.S. system, at least so far, is providing that one-year uh, grace period, which, which is great. Um, but only in the U.S. But only in the U.S., correct. Yeah. And we, you know, we, we have not taken over the world yet. So. <laughs> and like YouTube it, it looks, has. It looks, it, looks, it, looks, it looks actually the other way. Yeah, that yeah, like the world happened. is taking over the U.S. <laughs> on that side. And we're trying to, uh, quote, unquote, harmonize U.S. system with the rest of the world when in, you know, from that perspective, that was one of their reasons U.S. Uh, in innovation system coming from academia has been the most successful compared to uh, the rest of the world. And now we're trying to kill it by the pretense of harmonizing it with the rest of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. It's Well, and also, I mean, you, you use the term harmonizing, and in fact, that's one of the things, particularly America, has uh, a tradition of we're, we're not going to go in like the Romans and just slash and burn and, and impose our will, we're going to go in and discuss and try to reach uh, consensus and so forth. And, um, so if we try to harmonize in this area, uh, you could very well find yourself actually at the backside of some sort of sticky issue. Yep, 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 no, absolutely. How likely do you see them changing the patent system from first to first? Highly. I mean, it's been going on for years. This, this whole thing is sort of like, there, you know, Congress gets ahead of steam up. One one house passes legislation, the other one doesn't. Um, Congress ends their session. Everybody goes home. They start again. So it's been going on a long time. But I got to tell you, they're as close as I've ever seen. I mean, both houses have passed a bill. Uh, they have to harmonize that. Uh, to get one that they both sign and um, that the president would sign, but it's close, and it's it. Uh, you know, uh, Eugene and Scott and I have talked about. You know, this is it's going to have a profound effect on um, patenting in this environment, particularly because of the first to file. I mean, there's a lot of things. The grace period will still, if, if the legislation holds as it's configured, will hold for your work. But the idea of saying, I made an invention earlier than somebody else that published you know, within a year, uh, that'll go away. You, know, you won't be able to, quote, quote unquote, as we put it, swear behind whatever they did. How are trade secrets performed? You know, for example, the Coca-Cola formula. Well, that's a whole different, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's going the other way. That's basically not, the idea of patenting is it discloses to everybody what you have, and then within, as when the term ends, everybody can use what you sure. had disclosed. It's trade secrets is the other way around. You don't. Your protection is based on secretiveness. Well, Coca Cola has never patented That's right. That, that, they that's chose why. not. They chose not to. That that is why. All of a sudden, you invalidate Coca Cola's ability to make Coca Cola. Um, no. <laughs> there's something. Well, there's all kinds of issues around that. But the, you know, first of all. Coca-Cola, you know, it, there's issues around that, but the odds of uh, you being able to stop Coca-Cola are pretty low because there's something called prior use of rights that Coca-Cola would, would likely be able to take advantage of. But, you know, it's, it's some, there's a whole issue with, with you know, Coca-Cola kept it secret. They never disclosed the formula. Somebody else, you know, this, this happens in a lot of environments. And, you know, can somebody get a patent? Well, there's probably not much to stop them because under the, what's prior art is probably not... There's nothing prior art about what Coca-Cola is doing. They're, they're, they're not publicly disclosing this formula. They aren't publishing it. They're selling it, but in a way that doesn't disclose the formula. So theoretically, somebody else could get a patent, but our odds are there's this prior user right that would let Coca-Cola continue. Um, 
Oftentimes, a lot of companies would print out the terms patent pending on their products already in the market. Yeah. Um, what's the logic in that um, that qualifies the prior art? Um, does it provide any uh, protection? Um, it's actually, there's something going on now that can get them into trouble doing that if there's no patent, any, no patent application pending anymore, no patent enforceable. Uh, basically, it's called marking. Um, so it's basically to keep people away if, they're, you know, if, if they've got a patent, it's a warning. I mean, it does have some value as far as accruing damages and things, but it's gotten people into trouble lately with false marking because people can sue other people that are falsely marking and get money. So there's this whole cottage industry of suing people for that. Uh, we're curious if there's a list out there stating everything that's been patented, and if so, is it something that people access? Um, that's a pretty, pretty uh, large um, like how job. How would you know what has been Well, I mean, I assume you mean in a particular technology? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so you can do a search. You know, you can go online. Um, you can hire people to do searches. So. There's a whole, like if you have a, like a good, you know, you, you probably do more searching and literary search searching than I've ever done, but you know, you can go online and look up, you know, a topic. So say you're interested in um, coal gasification, so you can go and find all the patents, and, which would be still too much. Um, mm -hmm. You go out and do a search on a topic like that. People used to be, in, back in the Stone Age when I first started, uh, you would manu people would manually go through the patents in a particular subject area and, and see what's there to figure out whether you could get a patent or not. But there's all kinds of ways to search, as long as you can limit your topic enough to make it um, a match. But it's, you know, there's like seven million some odd patents out there in the U.S. So you know, you want to be able to focus it down. One more, and I got to keep moving. So if the patent form goes through, then you wouldn't be telling inventors to write it in a logbook and have somebody witness it. Would just be first to file. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I still wouldn't give that advice. Uh, started. I started a topic that I wasn't really intending to get into, but it's, it's an important topic. Um, so there's something basically. It, say um, this kind of gets into. It's, it's got a. It's got relevance. So remember how Mike said, "Be careful who you collaborate with." So there's all kinds of ways that, you know, permutations of bad collaboration. So one of them is where you decide to co-invent, you know, you're collaborating in a scientific way with people. And say that goes bad. And they go and file their own patent application and leave you off. Well, how, you know, that's gonna, this is all going to survive and um, in this patent reform that you could challenge that because you invented, you know, they took it from you and they left you off. So it's still important. Okay, I'm going to keep moving. So freedom to operate. And this takes a bunch of different uh, forms. Um, it, there's sort of a patent issue, um, freedom to operate question, and then there's sort of an agreement um, issue uh, to freedom to operate. So remember we talked about the difference between a patent and a patent application. So there's no real freedom to operate issue with a patent application, because again, nobody knows what the rights are going to be as far as your, your uh, right to exclude. Patent is a different matter. So when we get a patent that is potentially a problem, we um, have to look at something called infringement. Do they, um, we infringe somebody's claims? And that requires a fairly complicated um, analysis where we're going to look and figure out what their claims mean, which is not simple. We're going to look at whether the claims literally encompass what um, the claims call for, what, what somebody's doing. And if they are, they, they are outside the literal scope of the claims, we still look at whether there's a substantial similarity between what we're doing and what somebody else's patent claims cover. Um, to the extent this sounds complicated, it is. And it's um, something not to take lightly. And this is the issue um, people that are doing due diligence are going to look at. Are, is is uh, what you're doing going to be covered by somebody else's patent claims, and therefore, there's no freedom to operate? OK, what about agreements? So this is aside from patents. Most people talk about freedom to operate in the context of, agreement, uh, of patents. What about agreements? Well, you better be careful what you sign in an agreement. So if somebody sponsors research in, in a, your lab, and in there there's a, a gotcha that is, says, OK, we're going to own everything. If, you know, that's, generally speaking, I'm sure your sponsored programs make sure that doesn't happen. But in a company desperate for money, maybe you know, people don't pay as close attention to that. 
So, you know, they basically it could be your technology, you could be an inventor on the patent, and you could even be, um, well, 